Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Pat McIntosh. Pat is the chairman of the board for Bolton Clark, which I'll get Pat to explain about uh, in a moment and, and does other things and has, I've been really looking forward to this conversation, a, a really interesting leadership journey. Uh, Pat, welcome to the podcast. Okay, you want me to intro now? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, welcome to, 
So yeah, we're going. Welcome to the podcast. Okay. <laughs> we're keeping it real. Okay, John. <laughs> hey, it's so good to chat with you. Um, I would love to, first of all, for listeners, to can you tell everyone about the different hats you wear at the moment, uh, the different things you're you're involved in as a leader right now, Pat? Um, sure thing. Um, probably the main one at the moment is um, I'm the chair of Bolton Clark. Bolton Clark is a very large aged care provider um, in Australia. We provide uh, residential aged care, um, at-home support and retirement living. Uh, we are the biggest at-home support provider, the th third largest um, residential care provider and a very significant retirement living provider. So we're one of uh, very few organisations that, um, that cover the, uh, the continuum of, um, of sort of um, aged care. Um, we've got 10,000 employees, um, assets of about $2 billion, um, a revenue of over a billion dollars. Uh, we operate throughout Australia, um, so it's a very significant organisation. Um, and we've just, um, in the last few months, acquired um, Ality, which is a, um, a, a an organisation that had 44 residential aged care facilities. We've integrated that into the Bolton Clark Group, um, and we've also just merged with Acacia Living over in uh, Western Australia. So we've merged them into the group as well. Um, just over the last few months. So um, Bolton Clark was large before, but in the last three or four months, it's effectively doubled in size. Um, I'm also the chair of a couple of Bolton Clark subsidiaries. One provides uh, disability, child wellbeing, and, um, and health home care in New Zealand. Um, and also um, Altura Learning, which is a very significant um, um, training organisation uh, with global reach. It's got, uh, we're in, you've got 60% of the market share for aged care in Australia, uh, but we're also in Ireland, the UK and New Zealand. So I'm the chair of, of that organisation as well. And I'm also um, on a uh, credit union board, the uh, Southern Cross Credit Union um, down in New South Wales. So um, I, I do that in my uh, spare time as well. I'm not the chair of the Southern Cross Credit Union. I just happen to be on the board. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for unpacking uh, the different the different things you're involved in and uh, incredible about that, uh, like you mentioned, the story of uh, of Bolton Clark and uh, doubling in size in recent months. That's, uh, that's incredible. And uh, really for those listeners who might be overseas, um, it's, uh, it's great for them to understand some of the scale of the organization that you are, um, uh, leading as chair of the board or that you're, you're heading up the governors. Uh, so I would love to ask you about your story, Pat, let's start with growing up your, your childhood. What were some of the, some of the stories, the moments, the themes from growing up for you that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today? Well, I, I was, um, I grew up in the Lockyer Valley in, in Queensland, which is a small crop agricultural area. Um, and my people, my family were on the land. Um, I never had any great interest in being a farmer. I would do lots of work, um, but um, that was pretty much it because I was always going to leave the land. I, um, I went to a boarding school in Toowoomba um, and um, I was, uh, yeah, that, that boarding school was selected by my father because um, it had a very significant cadet union, unit and while dad had never served in the military, um, he, he sort of felt that um, I had an interest in it and was doing what he could to help me fulfil that. So um, I was a, a, um, an under officer in the cadets for three years and um, I was in charge of the cadet unit uh, in year 12. Um, I, um, had a, I was intent on joining the military as an officer I uh, had a Duntroon scholarship, and um, that was what was likely to happen the, um, in my year after I finished year 12. Um, fortunately, um, or unfortunately, the boarding school I was at decided to, um, to go co-ed in year 12, our final year. Uh, it was a rush decision. We didn't know about it when we left at the end of year 11, uh, and when we arrived in year 12, we were co-ed. Um, the, it hadn't been planned very well. Um, the girls had learned different things in year 11 to us and, uh, 
And uh, long story short, it was the worst academic um, year in Downland's history. Um, and as a consequence, I failed to matriculate by one point. So I did a lot of things for the next four or five years, um, trying to work out where I was going to go next as I wasn't at Duntroon. Um, in the end, I found out about um, an officer's training organisation called Portsea. Um, and at the age of 22, I um, passed the selection board and uh, went into Portsea to, uh, to do my officer training. Um, so I did end up fulfilling um, my destiny of becoming an army officer. Um, I just did it several years um, later than <laughs> what I uh, should have done. Um, as a consequence of that in those days, uh, people left the military at very young ages unless you got to be a very senior general. Um, so there were age limits on what you could do. Um, so I found out when I did join that um, I really couldn't go to staff college. I had no prospects of ever commanding a battalion and I was in infantry and therefore never any great prospects of being a general. Um, so I, um, because of the age, only because of the age. Um, so I decided to uh, start uh, pursuing some tertiary training and, um, and over the next half a dozen years, I, um, I completed a, um, a HR degree. Um, and I then also completed an accounting degree, and then I went on to complete an MBA. Um, and in the meantime, the Army changed their rules around age and decided that anybody who um, was of a certain age and wasn't substantive, um, but had performed exceedingly well, um, could pick up seniority. And uh, so I did. And I picked up the maximum seniority that they were allowing, which pretty much put me back to where I would have been had I gone to Duntroon. So um, I then was able to continue with the career um, and not need to leave to uh, pursue other business uh, opportunities. Um, so um, I basically then became an army officer with a whole bunch of business um, qualifications. And um, that, so that was pretty much it. I, um, it was a tough journey because, um, you know, when you, when you're four or five years behind your, what, what are your peers by age, um, it's very difficult to catch up. Um, and um, I, I'm proud to say that I did. By the time I commanded um, the, the online infantry battalion um, after 18 years of service, I was doing that uh, with somebody who um, had gone to Duntroon in the year um, that I would have gone. So. I wow. did manage to uh, to catch up to everybody else in that time frame, and then went on to senior rank within the military, um, commanding forces, uh, commanding infantry battalions, commanding the land warfare centre, uh, commanding the um, medical support force that we deployed into Rwanda immediately after the genocide, um, commanding a motorised brigade, um, and um, in my final sort of job in the military as a brigade commander, I was appointed to command the UN force in East Timor. Um, but unfortunately, a month or two before I was due to take up that appointment, my then wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer um, and given mm. seven months to live. So that clearly oh, wow. wasn't going to happen. So mm. I resigned from the army at that point to care for her and be there for my kids. Um, so that's... Um, so my leadership aspirations were from virtually from a very young age, uh, certainly at school and, uh, and everything I've done um, sort of after I eventually got into the military was very much leadership related. Um, so um, I think I was destined for a leadership role and uh, I would have found it whether it had been in the military as it turned out, but um, I would have mm. gone and pursued it in business um, had they not changed that age criteria. And they did. Yeah, that's um, what a what an amazing story, and and uh, like you said, incredible that you were playing catch up, and um, and also uh, you know I, I'm just so sorry to hear that you were so about to be posted, and then had um, had that real um, tragic um, tragic news within your family, which uh, which prevented that that next posting. But uh, you know there are there are priorities, I I guess, and and that was. Um, yeah, I just really admire you making that decision and and um, to choose to stay back and uh, and care for your wife and, and kids. 
Well, the family comes first at the end of the day, and uh, when anybody who understands the military, you know just how much the family have to give up. Um, yeah. You know, help, um, supporting somebody who's in the military. So when something like that happens, um, you do what you have to do. It's, um, it was a mm. very easy decision for me to make, although it was at a critical time for me in terms of where I was progressing to. But you, you don't think about that. You just uh, you do what you've got to do. You're there for your family and you move on and then do something else, which is what I ultimately did. So after uh, after the military, was that was that the end of your military career at that point? Or what, what, what did your career look like between then and now? Uh, when I left the military, I, um, I tend to, when I leave something, I tend to go. Um, so I didn't stay on in, in reserve, you know, um, to, you know force yeah. roles. Um, I could have, but I didn't. Uh, and look, to be really honest, the reason I didn't do that was that um, it's very unfair on senior reserve officers who have been working up through their whole career um, to get up into senior ranks and then have somebody from the regular forces like myself um, step out, join the reserves um, and then take those sorts of roles, which is what would have happened. Um, and to be really honest, I'd, um, I'd done a lot of work with these people over the years and I didn't uh, feel that I um, should do that to them, so I didn't. But what I did do was um, I, I'd left the military far too early for me to be able to retire on any kind of a significant army pension. So um, I, I, I started a financial planning business and, um, and I ran that financial planning business for probably uh, the best part of about nine or ten years. Um, and um, and it um, just had that thing working really damn well when the GFC happened. So, um, <laughs> so that was a really interesting period in, in my life. Oh, sort of oh dealing my goodness. With the fallout from a GFC after you've just got your financial planning business sort of um, yeah. um, up and running. Um, and um, so I, I did that for several years. And then um, when they uh, introduced all of the compliance after the GFC, yes, the compliance that was just absolutely ridiculous because everyone's assuming that some of the, uh, the rogue financial planners out there that were all the same. Uh, so they brought in compliance that really prevented you from providing uh, financial advice, essentially. Uh, yes. And, uh, and I'm not a compliant person. So um, when they, uh, that was the final straw for me. So I sold the business. And uh, when I sold that business, I, I went on to a board, which was um, a military sort of, it wasn't a military board, it was an RSL care. So it was, um, yes. it was a care organization that had been founded 75 years ago by the RSL. So I was asked to join that board and I did. And that started the journey for me in the aged care sector because there was a lot of, um, there were a lot of things that needed to be done very, very quickly in that organization um, to shape it to, you know, not only sort of prosper, but to survive and prosper really. And, um, and that involved, um, you know, establishing a skills-based board and, um, and, uh, and working with the existing board to get them to understand the need for that and for them to agree to the, the full process for us to implement that within a couple of years, which we did. And, um, and I then became the chair of that board and, um, and that's wow. where the journey for Bolton Clark started. And it wasn't that long ago, it was only 2012. Um, yeah. So we started off with RSL Care and uh, and then very, you know, very soon after that, we uh, merged with the Royal District Nursing Society out of Victoria, brought them into the group, and uh, we've been acquiring and merging ever since. Um, <laughs> and um, so we've gone from what was a very small organisation to um, you know, basically, in the overall context of aged care, the biggest in Australia, um, in a period of about 10 years. And I've been the chair of that company from from then through to now, so uh, so basically, I incredible. It was military, and then um, in the finance world, and now basically, um, you know, corporate boards. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I have so many questions I could ask because I I think your journey is um, really interesting. The the main one that popped into my head as you were unpacking your leadership journey 
what was the transition like from military leadership to financial running your own business? What were the biggest, uh, I'm interested to know what were the things that proved exactly the same in terms of principles of leadership and what were the things that were completely different, if any, um, to leading in the military? Well, look, the approach that I took to, to leading in the military is um, I, I ran every unit that I was in and I was in command more than I was anything else. But I, I would run those units as if they were my own business. And um, and uh, and I had the accounting qualifications, MBAs and you know, whatever to to enable me to be able to do that. So, um, so yeah, I, I manage people. I manage the... Um, you know, the efficiencies of the organisation. Um, one thing that the military does teach you is, is about strategic planning. So, um, you know, you've, you've got to be strategic about whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and, and that's very similar to going into business. When you're in business, um, you're not looking at what you're doing right now. You're not looking at what you used to do and, um, and trying to protect that. You're looking at at your industry, you're looking, you know, at at, at your your sector. Um, you're looking at the broader economy. You're, you're looking to the future, and you're looking at at where realistically you can take your organisation. And um, now, going into a financial planning business really meant that I was growing that business uh, from grassroots grassroots level. And the only way you can do that is to be competent in what you're doing, but also to have the interpersonal skills to be able to work with people and, um, and you know, have the trust for them to, you know, to allow you to manage their money, um, as well as the, the skills to understand how to do that well. So look, those, that's the same with any job that you're in. Um, you've, you've got to be competent at what you do and, um, and you've got to be able to work with people and get the best performance out of people and um, and all, all stakeholders, mm. you know. So, so look, I, I found, um, I, I never found the transition into the business world all that difficult. And um, in fact, I, you know, my approach to anything I do in leadership is to be incredibly analytical about what I do. So um, when I'm in a new job, I analyze it. I analyze it very, very quickly. Um, and I work out, you know, what everybody else is doing and what they're doing well and what's, you know, what can be improved. And, um, and, and I, you know, I formulate plans to do that and I execute them fairly quickly and fairly ruthlessly. Um, so um, I, I pretty much took a, a military approach to uh, a lot of the things I do. Um, I mean, you know, even on the Bolton Clark board, the, um, the board members become amused sometimes when people ask, you know, yeah, what's your background? What do you do? And I tell them I was a trained killer. Um, but uh, just to make light of the situation. But, uh, but you know, so so look, it's uh, it's mate, it, when you're in a leadership role, you're leading. It's just the context of of what you're doing that, that changes. Um, you know, yeah, in my view. No, you're right, and uh, and uh, something that I hadn't thought of until you mentioned it there is that. In your story, you really were in, like you said, you did your studies. You were in that, um, you know, sort of corporate training environment and then went to military and then came back to corporate. And, and I agree, leadership is uh, is about more than anything else, uh, you know, really managing and leading people. If you get that wrong, everything else is, uh, you know, falls to pieces. I, I want to ask you about strategic planning. What... If you were going to sort of summarize what you believe or, or what your sort of framework is for strategic planning, say there's a listener somewhere, maybe they're in uh, in the UK and they're running a business and they and they know that they need to be more strategic. <laughs> what what makes a solid strategic plan for you? Uh, look. Um... To have a, a solid strategic plan, you've got to understand your business and you've got to understand the environment in which that business operates. Um, because you know, if you're operating strategically, you're operating out into a future. Um, you've got, you have you have to be able to visualise that future. Okay, And um, good leaders can do that. But you can't visualise something if you don't understand the business as it is right now and all of the drivers for change. 
So yes. um, and you need to be very customer focused, uh, like in business anyway, you've got to be very customer focused because it's the customers that, uh, that, that, that are going to take you to where you want to go. So look, it's, um, I, I think the first thing you have to do is to know your business and you've got to know it intimately um, and you can't be half-hearted about that. And you've, you've got to be seen to be an expert in, in your business that, so people will listen to you and respect what you're saying. Um, and then you have to be able to work out you know, where your industry and your sector is going, where it needs to go. Like, for instance, in aged care, it's an ageing population. The aged care um, resources are not going to be enough to cope with the significant sort of um, numbers of yes. aged population coming. This is across the world. Um, the aged care sector is doing it really tough, has been for years. Um, and very few organisations in Australia, you know, it's probably the same everywhere else, um, are growing in this environment. Many of them are stagnating. Many of them are failing. Uh, some of them have just been taken over by, by merger because they failed. Um, and Bolton Clark is, has, um, has doubled in size. Now, we didn't do that by accident. We set an objective in 2017 to double in size by 2025. We just managed <laughs> to achieve it by the beginning of 2022. Um, but the reasons for that were, were very, re they were good reasons. You know, we, yes. we wanted to maintain or exceed our market share. We wanted yes. to be in a position of influence. And you can't be in a position of influence if you're not in, say, the top four or five providers yeah. within a sector. You know, if you want to go and have seats with government, if you want them to seek your advice around what the hell to do, then mm -hmm. you've got to be up there. Uh, you've got to be one of the big ones and you've got to be one of the best. So um, so we've done things in Bolton Clark, for example. There's We have a research institute um, that we fund um, and not, not solely fund. It gets research grants from other places. But what they're getting grants for is, grants for is what we want them to do, which is what needs to be done for yes. the enhancement of the aged care sector. So we are the only organisation in Australia that, that has one of those. We acquired Eltura Learning, which was a, uh, had 60% of the market share for training in aged care, and we brought the company. Um, you know, so it's you know, training of your workforce is a very significant um, thing. and. Um, and you can stand out from the rest if you're an employer of choice um, yes. by providing leadership training, development training, and and um, and skills training. So um, yeah, we, we've we've done that, and we've we've brought a company to do it with. So um, <laughs> and at the same time, we're looking at opportunities for expanding that business out out of outside of Australia, and that's and it's going very very well. Um, so look, it's um, yeah, you've got to be well. Being strategic means you're looking ahead. Um, you've got to be you know you have to be a visionary, but you do need to be able to envision where you want to take this organisation, and that's got to be based on your assessment of um, of of the needs within your sector and the gross prospects within your sector. OK, um, so you're not mm -hmm. going to just go out there and double in size or hope to double in size um, if the market's never be going to be there for it. And all you're going to do is destroy a very good small business by trying to make it too big and end up failing. Um, so, yeah, the key thing for a, for a leader is to be strategic, to get everybody thinking about the future, um, visualising yes. that future and then being able to craft realistic objectives to get you to that future and, and, and be absolutely cutthroat about it on the way through because, believe me, there's going to be a lot of hurdles. And, and if you <laughs> don't believe in yourself, then people are not mm. going to believe in you. So they've got to have confidence in your ability to create a strategic plan, bring everybody else into that planning process so at the end of the day they own the process, okay? There's, yeah. you, you go in and just do it yourself because you can, because you're you know, you might be the smartest person in the room, and you impose that on everyone, it's not going to mm -hmm. work. Okay? Mm -hmm. you, you've got to have the vision and you've got to share that vision and you've got to find you know, people that are going to come on the journey with you. You've got to find people that are capable of being empowered um, and you've got to develop those who haven't got the ability just yet to be empowered or let others go 
all of those things are critical to this journey, but they have got to own the plan at the end of the day. And you've got to you know, very cunningly get them to, um, to own that plan. And that's, you can only do that by them developing um, the plan sort of with you. And, and they, they then take ownership of it. Um, and if you, if you can do that, and, and, and getting it right, of course, is important. Yeah, you, yeah. You know, a silly plan, no one's going to want to take ownership of that. Um, <laughs> but if it's the right plan, you, you know, you, you'd make sure that they accept ownership of it and they get the credit for the execution of it and all of the, all mm. of the successes that come with it as well. So good. So many great things in there. Uh, I can imagine, I think of myself as listener number one, and I'm always thinking what questions are listeners thinking of, and they're often the questions that pop into my head. And <laughs> this is the question that came up as you unpacked that, and there was so much good that was in there. How do you go about really understanding your own business and understanding the market? Because I know a lot of people think they do, and I think if you press them, they probably don't. So how do you go about making sure you have a thorough data-driven understanding of your own business and the uh, environment? Uh, well, look, in, in the aged care sector, um, a lot of it's around demographics. Um, you know, the, the demographics, I would say the aging population, the alternatives that they have, um, understanding, you know, what, what is affordable and what's not affordable. Um, and, you know, we were lucky in the aged care sector, if you could see it, um, was um, that, for once, you've, you've got something that what the people wanted is what the, is the only thing that the government could afford. Okay, so um, people want to remain in their own homes for as long as possible. Okay, so what that tells you is that you've got to be involved in the home care part of the business because that's where the real growth is going to be. Because most people will stay in their homes right to the palliative stage of their lives. Um, so um, so we, we grew the home care part of our business um, just as much as we grew the residential care part of our business. We also understood that, um, that we need that people did not want to move from their current homes uh, more than once. So if they did decide to move into, say, a retirement village, um, you know, as part of their downsizing exercise, then they needed to make sure that they had whatever care was needed for them in that environment. Yeah. So, so we, we're in the, the retirement village you know, world, but we were one of only 2% of providers that provided home care and residential aged care co-located with those retirement villages. So that's a case of, of understanding your customer, and yeah. um, and and that's absolutely critical now. And and others in our sector are, are trying to sort of to do that because that's what people want. So you know, understanding that that people want to be at home, they want to stay well for as long as possible. So we took a wellness approach to our you know, to our our strategy, and uh, we've got wellness programs and all those sorts of things that um, that we roll out for the hundreds of thousands of clients that, that we look after. Um, but also in, um, in residential care, while people want to live for as long as they can and even potentially pass away at home, and that certainly happens, there's no doubt about that, um, some just can't do that and they need to be in a residential care facility. Um, and the alternative to that is a geriatric hospital and the, the price difference between the two is about $1,400 a day versus about three to $400 a day. So from a government perspective, wow. they want people to stay at home because home care is cheaper than residential care or hospital, but they understand that they still need to provide those residential care facilities because they're cheaper than a geriatric hospital. So understanding all of that just leads you to say, right, we've got to have a growth strategy around growing our residential care facilities We've got to have a growth strategy around um, providing um, at-home support, home care um, to people. Um, and we've got to take a wellness approach to everything that we do, and it's got to be customer-centric. So we, yeah, we, we deal with our customers, not the, just the current ones, but the ones of the future. 
and find out from them what it is that they want. And, yes. and then it takes a hell of a long time to develop some of these new built forms and concepts. So you've got to be in front of that, uh, not mm. at the bleeding edge of it necessarily, but you've got to be at the front edge of it so that, um, that when that particular cohort is coming through the system, you have for them what it is that you know they want. So that's, I think, where Bolton Clark's success has been, is that yeah. strategic planning process, looking out five, seven years in terms of where we needed to be in terms of growth, targeting the exact growth that we wanted, and then getting our research institute and our training organisation working on wellness approaches and a whole range of things like that, working with universities. Um, we co-design our facilities with universities. We co-design them with the residents. We co-design them um, with, the, um, with, with the people within the, commu the broader community. Um, and we've won international awards for doing that, you know. So, so it's it's not just a case of well, okay, we're in the aged care business, we better go and build a, a residential aged care facility somewhere. Um, it's it's really difficult, and you've got to be really smart about it. And if you are, you, you're going to be successful. And I think that um, what's Bolton Clark's success really, I think, and everyone on the board and, and the executive know this and say it it really stems from the strategic planning process that we put in place um, back mm. in about 2016, 17. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about execution? You talked about being ruthless. Um, what, <laughs> I guess, what does that look like? How can how can leaders, uh, I, I guess that I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this, but are there any keys to sticking to executing a strategic plan that you've learned from corporate, from the military and leadership, uh, because I see a lot of leaders who have a great plan, but then struggle to stick to it and execute. How have you been able to do that? Um, well, when you, you've got to tie your KPIs to the strategic plan um, and you've got to make sure that your key people are incentivized to achieve their KPIs. So, um, and, and if they're, they're part of the strategic planning process, so you're not imposing the impossible on them. You are getting them to work out what needs to be done, okay? Um, and, you know, and being really strategic about it, but getting them to own the future, own the strategy, and then turning that strategy, you know, defining it as KPIs and breaking those KPIs. So if you've got a, a plan that goes out, say, five years or more, you know, there's no sense sitting there saying, you know, okay, your KPI for this year is that we, we need to double in size by 2025. You know, can you see, oh, beauty, I could work here for the next three or four years and then leave. Um, yeah, so what you've got to do is you've got to break it down into realistic chunks um, so that e after each year you're achieving what it was you were seeking to achieve and, um, and then you turn those into KPIs. And, and the only thing, and the way we operate in Bolton Clark is that for anything that comes to the board, they, we use the Three Horizons um, strategic planning process. It's only a one-page job. There is nothing that can come to the board that isn't linked to that strategic plan. And that is the first thing that they have to do. So mm -hmm. the first thing in, mm -hmm. in the board pack is this is where it links to the strategic plan so we can see that we're doing something that we need to do and we're not yep. doing something else. Um, and then it's the resolution, you know, and then we go on from there. So we know exactly what it is they're asking us to do and we won't even look at it if it's not tied to the strategic plan. And in fact, they can't even bring it to us if it's not tied to the strategic plan. So absolutely everyone in the organisation is working towards, you know, an outcome. And that's, I think, if you do that, you, then you, you just can't help but achieve what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, like we've grown um, faster than what our plan was. Um, but we have rejected probably 75% of the acquisition opportunities that were sent our way. Yeah, so we have been absolutely, talk about being ruthless, you know, um, we're ruthless about what we take and what we don't take. Um, and, um, and when we merge with organisations, we're fairly ruthless about, you know, the terms of that merger as well, you know, because we know what will work for yes. us. And we know, uh, and and we're willing to walk away. You've always got to be willing to walk away in business, you know. Um, so, so look, I, I think uh, 
having own, people ownership of the plan, tying it to KPIs and, um, and having them sort of, you know, being part of that process is, is absolutely imperative because if they believe in what they're doing and they believe that what we're asking them to do is achievable and we provide them with the necessary resources to go and do it, then basically if they haven't done it, then you've got the wrong people trying to do the job. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love um, what you said about Ruthless there because I think uh, it's so simple, isn't it? And and it's, it's funny. I, I say to people so often, any work I do with leaders, uh, I, I love the Patrick Lencioni quote that he talks about building healthy teams, but I think it applies for nearly all leadership. It's um, it's remarkably, you know, that building a team, uh, strategic planning, achieving that vision is both remarkably uh, simple and possible, but painfully difficult. And the difficult part is sticking to the plan. It's about clarifying it so it's crystal clear and then not wavering. <laughs> and um, it's not rocket science, but it's so easy in all the complexities and all the abstractions or the really tempting merger deal that you go, oh, for this one, this looks so good that we can probably give up those terms that are linked to the strategic plan. And, and what you're saying, which I, I love how simple it is, because I agree, is is have it have a really clear strategic plan that everything's linked to, and then don't deviate from that. Well, look, if, if you have confidence in that you've got it right, you're confident in your own ability and um, and you understand your sector, you understand the demographics or whatever the key components of your, you know, of your, um, your strategy are going to be, um, then basically there's no reason to, to doubt it. There's no reason to walk away from it. And, um, and you're always going to set a strategic objective that's that's difficult it's got stretch in it you know i've got to tell you in the last three or four years the number of times some people have said this this, this is an unrealistic objective for us to double in size by 2025 in a sector that's had the funding cut from it to the length that it has um and and in a sector that uh, can't get the, re the 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 staffing and there's so many problems in this sector it's just not funny um but we we just said no you can do it you will do it these are the objectives you go and go and do them and uh, and all of a sudden here we are you know three years earlier than what we thought we're there you know so um <laughs> and we're not going to stop there either to be brutally honest you know, i mean it's not going to stop there so um no it's look you've got to have confidence in yourself um and if you haven't got confidence in yourself then you're certainly your people under you are not going to have it um and if they they respect you and um and they're informed as you are about where yeah the sector you, they'll get there yeah you just got to get the right ones i think one of the key components of it is you can't do it all yourself and you shouldn't be doing virtually any of it yourself as the mm. leader um yes. you're the you're the key motivator that's sitting up there at the top um and um, the one with sort of the the vision you're willing to share but it's um it's getting that that concept of empowerment um and the concept of intent embedded in your organization and um and if you can empower people to um to to do the job and you can hire people that wouldn't operate unless they were empowered um then then honestly you, you're, you're on the right trajectory the one problem that you tend to have um though is people will empower those who are not capable of being empowered um so you just can't go and empower anybody um, you empower somebody who thoroughly understands where you want to take the organisation, thoroughly understands their, their role, their sector, that they, they've got the knowledge that they need to do it, they're good leaders, and you just you know, give me, you know, be confident in me, I know what you want, let me go and do it, just give me the resources. You know, if you can get someone who can do that, then you can go you know, a million miles. Um, you empower somebody who hasn't got that skill set, then you're going backwards at a million miles an hour. Um, so, um, and also, <laughs> once you've got someone who's really empowered, you can you know, use the concept of intent. It's a military mm. concept, um, and it's all based on the fact that the plan doesn't survive H hour. H hour is when you cross the line of departure to go and attack somebody. 
And the, and the reason it doesn't survive HR is because you've got an enemy commander on the other side who's been thinking about this a little bit themselves. And they've worked out what it is they think you're going to do. And they've worked out what they're going to do to stop you from doing it. So clearly, um, it's very rare that what you're planning to do and what you think the commander on the other side will do, it doesn't normally pan out. What you have to do is make sure your commanders on the ground understand the intent that you're trying, you would like you know, for them to achieve. So that if all of a sudden they're given a task to go and do this, they can't do it, they've been blocked, but they understand that the intent is not necessary to go down that path, but to do something else over here, and they can find a way of doing it, then they have the, they've been empowered to go and do that. Okay, So um, you can do yes. that in business as well. If they understand the intent, what is it that we're trying to achieve? You don't then have to tell you know, to have a roadmap for them that's sort of marked out every corner. You know, you make sure they understand what their part of the, the job is, where we're going, and what their their part in that is, and <laughs> you empower them and you give them some flexibility to do it their way, as long as they're yes. ach achieving the intent. And, and believe me, you get people that'll work in that in, that. that that, that real relish that environment, you will not be able to get rid of them. You know, they, <laughs> that's what they come to work for every day. And that's exactly what you want. Yeah. 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 I, I love that so much. So intent, if we bring it back to strategic planning, the intent is really what you're communicating through the strategic plan by having those horizons of objectives so that if they knock on a particular door and that and that sort of tactic doesn't work they know that where you're wanting them to head is over here to, to achieve that so they'll find a different way to get there rather than you getting in the weeds and actually saying go and do x y or z it's about go and make this kpi happen yeah and you just you just don't want to be prescriptive about it i mean for instance if we're talking about you know doubling in size in our residential aged care um, assets, you know, within five years, which is what we did lay down. You know, uh, you don't just say to them that we therefore have to build this many facilities to achieve that, you know. No, yeah. I don't care how you do it. You go and acquire somebody, <laughs> you merge with people, you know, you yeah. build some, um, you know, <laughs> you, you just look at where the opportunities is. And if you can acquire an asset for cheaper price than, than you can build it at, which you can at the moment, then why would yeah. you build it? You just go yeah. out there and find who's got assets in the places that you want them and you can pick yeah. them up and they've got some kind of a moat around them so a competitor can't come jumping in next to you. Um, and, and you do it that way. Or the, the, it may be that the price of existing assets has become ridiculously expensive, so therefore building um, is, is important. Or the whole nature of what you do has changed because... All of a sudden, there's no low care in, in the care environment anymore. It's all high care, palliative care. And then you've mm. got a lot of people you know, with, with advanced dementia um, and you need a specific built form for dementia. So you're going to have to go out there and, and uh, build. So do you go and buy something that's already built? No, because no one's built them yet. So you may have to build. So look, you, you need to, they need to understand what it is that they need to achieve. And let them go and work out the best way to do it. They bring these ideas back to the board. They bring business cases back to the board. And in our mm. case, we've got a capital committee that work and an investment committee that works with management very early on in the process to mm. um, you know to say yay or nay, so that management's not wasting a lot of time and energy on on something that um, that yeah you know, we we yeah you know, we're not going to agree to at the end of the day. So you know. You have a very cooperative approach between, yeah, you know, management does the work because that's what they're getting paid for. Um, we, you know, we, we sign off on the big ideas and we then police those ideas, but we work with them to make sure they're not wasting any time. Um, so, yeah, look, in, the intent is, it's a concept that some people have difficulty getting their head around, but mm. um, it can work at the, at the lower level and at the, and at the top level, you know. They just yeah. got to understand what it is that you're intending for your organisation and let them go out there and find the avenues to achieve it, okay? Um, without being... Otherwise, you've just got to be prescriptive. And yes. the last thing anybody who's really worth it um, wants someone to do is to, you know, when they come into work to say, I want you today to do this, this, this and this. No, they don't. They want to be left alone to go and achieve what it is you told us you want us to achieve. 
and yeah. uh, and I'm going to come back with some really great ideas on how we can do that. And I expect you to listen to them, and uh, and I expect you to resource them. You know, so that's the sort of person <laughs> that you want. You know. Oh, so good. I just love, and I found it really helpful the the um, explanation you gave it from the military that you know that there's a there's a commander. You know, I've never thought about it like that for business. You know that you've got your plan, but you know that your competitors are going to be watching and trying to move, and and they've got their own plans too. And and I love that idea. That's such a helpful way to factor in competition. Um, and, and that idea of intent, that is just, I mean, I think I had heard of it before, but I hadn't really had it explained like you explained it. And that's, um, that's gold. I can see why that would really unlock for a lot of leaders, the challenge around how can I set clear objectives without being prescriptive? And that idea of intent just, just hits the nail on the head. Yeah. You make sure your objectives are measurable. Um, but you don't necessarily sit there and tell them how they've got to achieve it. You know, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, let them know this is the intent. You understand our intent. Good. Go and do it. And you, you don't let them go out there forever. And then all of a sudden say, Oh my God, where are they? Um, you know, they come back and brief you. They come back with their ideas, you know, and the, yes. the important thing about leadership is that they are their ideas and they own those ideas and you give them full credit for those ideas. Yes. Um, you know, you, you, you know, you might have sowed a seed or so, but you know, let them come up with the ideas so that they can go home proud at night and tell their partner that guess what I did today. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and everyone around them knows that it's their idea. You know that. Um, so oh, look, that's that's what yeah, you've got to. Look, you spend most of our time in our lives at work, and um, and work. I've always said work should be fun. You should enjoy it, but also you should be absolutely inspired. Um, mm. by those that you're working, you know, around you, working for and inspired by your own, you know, achievements. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, if you, and I think that's, that's really what leadership's about. It's about sort of um, just having people that, um, that just love working for you, you know. That's so good, Pat. Um, for those who've just really enjoyed hearing your thoughts today, is there anywhere online, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and also finding out about Bolton Clark for those in Australia and um, internationally who might be just really interested based on hearing you unpack uh, some of the um, interesting things that are happening there. Where can people find you online? Uh, look, um, Bolton Clark's got a website, obviously, um, you know, just www.boltonclark.com.au. Um, it's got all the information. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't update that very often, but I'm not there. Um, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so, yeah, um, I think our website's um, being revamped as we speak. They always are, but it gives a pretty good feel for what Bolton Clark does um, and, um, you yeah, and yeah, some of the great things we're doing. It's, um, it's been, it, we, we have, um, we've just been through a Royal Commission here in Australia. Uh, for yes. Year, and um, that was a fairly frightening pro prospects for most in the aged care sector. Um, we set a strategic KPI for the uh, CEO to basically um, uh, to grasp that as an opportunity, not as a threat. Um, we were called before the Royal Commission in different guises through our research institute, Altura Learning, and through Bolton Clark itself four times. And each mm. time we were called before it was to provide evidence to the Royal Commission about how things should be done. Um, not because things were not being done by us in, a, you know, in the right way. So, um, I, I mean, and, and that's that sort of, that's really what you, if you're going to be a leader in, in your business, then, then essentially you've got to be recognised by everyone as being a leader. And, and I think Bolton Clark has demonstrated their leadership when it came to, to COVID. Um, we enacted, um, um, you know, policies around COVID a month before it was even declared a pandemic. Um, we, wow. yeah, we just, yeah, we put things in place that were just incredible. Um, and had there been a real, you know, um, pandemic and, um, and a lot of older people do die when that occurs, um, we would have been, we were so ready for it. It wasn't funny, you know, and, um, so, wow. and, and this, this whole healthy aging thing, loneliness, we've got programs around all of those things that matter to people that are living at home alone that, you know, 
um, that that are scared about sort of going into facilities. You know, we've you know we we've just we just look at all of those things to um, to make sure that Bolton Clark is leading um, yeah. in in those processes and. Uh, so, so look, yeah, it's, it, the website's probably a good place to have a look at what Bolton Clark does, um, and uh, it's a great place to work. And um, we said a, one of our strategic objectives was to become an employer of choice a few years ago, and uh, <laughs> we're still working towards that. But um, there's a lot of components to that, as I'm sure you would understand. <laughs> but uh, but, it, but it, if you don't, if you don't have that kind of an objective, and if you don't yeah. understand it fully. You ain't going to achieve it, you know. So you, you've yeah. got to, you've got to, you've got to make sure that that's what you're striving for. Wow, this has just been one of my favourite episodes, Pat. I just have learnt so much, and uh, you are a very articulate communicator around. Uh, I think some things that are very simple and very obvious, and yet they get so confusing. And I feel like you've just distilled some key things around that. that around organizational health and achieving goals that that it's been such a joy i, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in i know a bunch of you are going to rewind this and listen back to it because i'm going to and <laughs> just to hear pat again unpack some of these things um it's just gold don't forget i also have the john o white leadership podcast and the leadership question of the day podcast that you can check out and uh you know continue to grow in your leadership but i want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Pat, for being so generous with your time and for sharing some of your story and your wisdom with us. It's been uh, such a joy to have you on the podcast. John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership, and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org, right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be.
Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.